Welcome to Education Talks, I'm David Burke. Nicholas Harris is very much a third culture kid. Having grown up in an international school setting, he's gone on to become an established and respected international teacher. I wanted to talk to him to find out about his pathway through international school, how this has impacted him as an international teacher, and what he's passionate about. Having previously worked with Nick, it was also great to catch up. Well, Nicholas Harris, welcome to Education Talks. Uh, thank you for having me, David. It's uh, great to have you on the show. Of course, uh, we worked together for a couple of years back in uh, in Jeju, and I was there, and uh, and you're still there. Are uh, you joining us from, uh, from uh, your home in Jeju? Yes, um, I'm coming in from uh, Jeju uh, Island in South Korea. We are the southmost part of uh, South Korea. It's a cool place. Um, certainly a favorite part of the world for me. Um, now, can you just also tell uh, viewers and listeners about your current role at the school you're at? Um, I'm a faculty member at the Korea International School Jeju. I teach AP Research and AP Psychology. Um, I'm also involved with the MUN program and the soccer program here. Very much part of the school community there. Um, now, you're quite unique as well on the international school scene because you're also an international student growing up. Can you share what that was like being an international student? Yeah, so uh, just a real brief background on myself. I was born and raised in Tokyo, and um, I attended the American school in Japan, a school in Tokyo there. And I was a student there from 1990 to 2005. So I did um, pre-K all the way until high school, the end of high school at the school. So um, you could say I'm very much a product of the international school system and the international school uh, education. What was, what was that like being a student, though, at the school? Um, the th school I went to was um, very heterogeneous. Um, there are a lot more mixed race kids now in Japan, just, you know, being on the train and stuff. I see students, you know, attending public school and stuff and, you know, adults, obviously, too. But um, when I was, you know, a kid in the 90s, uh, definitely there was much fewer of us. So it was kind of an interesting situation where in the general public, um, you didn't see as many mixed race kids. But then when you entered ASIJ, I want to say something about a quarter or a third of the school w was mixed race kids. And then the other 70% were made up of, you know, something like 30, 40 other nationalities. So it's almost kind of like a little UN um, in an otherwise very homogeneous city, uh, you know, Tokyo. You've mentioned to me about, um, you've used the phrase that the international schools, the international school kids club. Um, what, what, what do you mean when you, you talk about that? Yeah, um, obviously it's not an official club, uh, but I do think um, international schools are not, there's just not many. So even in a place like Tokyo, where, uh, you know, it's a big city, right? Tens of millions of people, we're talking 15 schools, depending on what your definition is of international mm -hmm. school. And then you're talking, let's say 50 kids on average to school. So we're, we're talking, you know, no more than 750 students graduating each year, from, you know, a city of over 15 million. So I do feel like um, I graduated back in 2005. Uh, but to this day, um, you know, I might be playing soccer in Tokyo and I'll meet, you know, someone who graduated 20, 2017, you know, or someone who graduated 1990 something. And it's very interesting because we, we click right away. And it's not limited to Tokyo. There's, you know, people I'll meet who went to HKIS or they went to Singapore American. And there is kind of this connection we all have. So I do feel like, um, you know, again, it's not an official club, but it's kind of, it's a weird, unique situation where this kid in Bangkok, right, who went to <laughs> NIST or, you know, Concordia or whatever, we have this connection, even if it's IB or not IB. Although I do feel like the kids who did IB kind of have that extra bit of, of you know, I guess, uh, history that they can share. Uh, and then, you know, same with the kids who did AP. So when did you decide you wanted to become a teacher? Um, I It was always in the back of my mind. Uh, my father had a very unique career path where he had his own company little translation company he ran until um, I want to say he was about 40. And then um, he changed careers and he started teaching at the American school in Japan. 
uh, where I was a student, maybe when I was in about fourth or fifth grade. Um, so because he was a teacher for, I think, 17 years, so about, you know, a little less than half of his career, um, it was always in the back of my mind that I'd like to do what my father did. I would like to go into some like politics or law, and then eventually I would switch over to teaching. Um, this changed though, after I spent a year as an associate at PricewaterhouseCoopers, um, I had the chance to work in various industries as you know, my position as a consultant. And I came up with a conclusion at the young age of 23 that all the industries <laughs> were not really appealing. <laughs> and that's including very long conversations I had with you know, lawyers, whether you know, I should try to go to law school, a lot of them said, don't go to law school. Uh, whereas with international school teachers, uh, most of them were just kind of like, yeah, you know, you should try to get your teaching license. So I had to make a, a big change to my life plan. Uh, and I got my teaching license, my master's in my early 20s. Uh, and yeah, so it was always in the back of my head. But basically, the plan was pushed forward about 20 years. So you got your uh, teaching license. And where did you get your your start? Uh, the first place I taught it was uh, Bahrain, uh, Manama City. I taught at a school called Modern Knowledge School. So I taught economics. And um, it was a tough school. Um, it was a school that really helped me with student management. It's probably the most uh, euphemistic way I guess I could uh, phrase things. Uh, but I, I really cherish uh, those days. It did have its moments. And I, I do really feel like... Um, a lot of international schools are cozy. That's the reality. Good facilities, good students. Um, this school uh, was not necessarily the best equipped facility-wise. We had to, you know, get on a bus for 20 minutes to go to our field to practice. Um, and you know, there were definitely more student issues than the schools I've worked at recently. Um, but I feel like it made me a much better teacher. So. Um, I do feel like uh, for young teachers, I think it's important to get some of that experience and exposure to you know difficult schools, difficult classes, because I think it really helps. Later on. Definitely. Um, what about being a former international student? How has that influenced your approach to teaching in an international school? Yeah, so I feel like this is why I'm here, right? I was looking at you know the profile of the various people you've had on already but half are doctors <laughs> and there are a few professors. So, you know, I obviously don't, I'm not at their level uh, in regards to hey, a lot what? of- What, you're not a doctor? You're not Dr. Aren't you Dr. Harris? No, sir. <laughs> no, and, and I probably will never get one, but I feel like where I can contribute is that background, right? That I am a product of the international school system. And it's definitely something I see more. Um, when I was a student at ASIJ, we just had one teacher uh, who went to SIJ himself, uh, Bobby Ghosh. And he was one of the inspirations for me of wanting to become a teacher. And because he knew how to connect with us, right? He was a ASIJ graduate and I was a SIJ high school student. So um, back then, yeah, there weren't as many, but my understanding now, just talking to people, various schools, there seems to be more people going from international school and they come back to the international school as teachers. And um, I think that's a great thing. I think it's a testament to, you know, students, liking school and wanting to go back to that system. And I think it also, you know, it goes back to what I said earlier about international schools being my home. Um, for some of us, it's all we know, right? So I grew up in Tokyo, um, Japanese mother, but there's really nothing about my background that is truly Japanese, right? I don't look Japanese, so people talk to me in English. I didn't go to a Japanese public school, so, you know, my experience was fully international. So it would not be an exaggeration to say my home is like ASIJ. My home is international schools. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I feel like the passion I feel towards international schools as a system, it is very strong. And to be honest, I do sometimes kind of feel offended when some people go to international schools as kind of a working holiday. And mm -hmm. I, I sometimes talk to people and they'll say things like, well, you know, the whole point of international school teaching is to be able to travel. I was thinking like, well, you know, for me, it's not, you know, <laughs> like I actually very much don't need to travel, but I, I like international schools. I believe in the system, right? I believe that international schools are a good thing and I like to be part of the system and I like to, um, you know, be involved and, in, you know, with students' education. For me, it's not just simply, oh, time away from home. I'm mm -hmm. going to use it to a bunch of vacations. Um, 
So yeah, I, I do feel like in that sense, the feeling I have, the passion I have towards the system itself is a little bit different than um, people who didn't graduate from international schools. Yeah, and now you also have the unique experience of being in an international school for quite an extended period of time, and not just that, but also a school that was relatively new when you got there. Um, can you tell us about uh, that experience? How long have you been at, at KSJ? Uh, it's my ninth year at a school that has been around for 11 years. So, um, and this maybe kind of connects to going back to the international school background. Um, I have spoken to some colleagues. Uh, when I say colleagues, I mean just loosely any international school teacher who graduated from a high school and then went to that school now as an educator. And I think there are pros and cons, right? <laughs> The pros are that you you know the place, right? You know the background, like you, you, you know the culture, usually. The cons is that schools change, right? Schools evolve. And I was talking to um, a colleague of mine in Japan not too long ago. Um, this person works at a school that she graduated from and she absolutely hates it because she kind of has these, you know, rose colored glasses of, you know, <laughs> the memory of, you know, being really awesome so I do think, you know, it, it is definitely something I do remind people uh, who are graduates from my school and they say, hey, I want to become a teacher. I tell them, look, um, you know, one, um, not every school is like the international school you went to. And two, it, it's different, right, being an educator. Um, so th there is a little bit sort of a little asterisk I, I try to put, you know, yeah. People ask me about becoming a teacher as a, you know, after being an international school graduate. I think you touched on some really interesting points there because I remember um, when I became a teacher, now I was very passionate about public education because that was where I come from, uh, worked in uh, public schools, even had the experience of going to, um, as, a, as a relief teacher, like a casual teacher working at my, um, my primary school that I went to which I was, you know, but didn't feel the same, same sort of thing, felt a bit, you know, disappointed. But I think what it emphasizes, and particularly mentioning about people who go into international schools to travel, our first and foremost responsibility when we're inside a school is to the students who are there then and now. Um, and that is, the, I think, the most important thing that I think every teacher who approaches things professionally, um, that's hopefully what they're bringing to the table, even if they're in a school for couple of years or in a school for a long long time now nick you're also the host of a podcast and uh, it's it's quite a unique podcast can you tell everyone about it yes um i run the uh, tokyo alumni podcast um i interview various alums from tokyo at least that was the original intentions i've had a few from outside of tokyo cheated a little bit um but yeah the the ethos of it was um as it, and I think a lot of other international school graduates can agree with me about this is when you get, you know, your sort of monthly email from schools, there's only so much they can include, right? You get a little blurb and, you know, it's, it's usually so-and-so passed away or it's like, so, or it's just like someone who's accomplished quite a bit, like, you know, so-and-so, you know, has recently become the CEO of Sony or, you know, so-and-so has, been nominated for this this book award, uh, which is all lovely stuff. But I really wanted to sort of dig in deeper and have people do these long interviews, 30 minutes an hour, uh, and basically just share with the audience, uh, which could be anyone. It could be parents. It could be just simply people from the community, um, their life. And, uh, you know, get a deeper look at where exactly do international school kids end up, because school profiles usually just stop at college, right? They say, here are the students matriculated to these schools. Good luck, guys, you know, thumbs up. And then, and then you know, later on, it's also very, very uh, brief, right? It's just stuff like, you know, so-and-so 20 years later did this. So I wanted to kind of get the, the scoop, you know, what, what exactly are people doing, what various industries, and, uh, you know, how has their international background helped them? And uh, yeah, that, that's sort of the ethos of why I started the podcast. And uh, how many episodes so far? Uh, 81 episodes. Uh, I just uploaded the 81st recently and um, I've slowed down a bit. Um, COVID was a great opportunity to really get in a bunch of episodes. Um, but, you know, it's 
the plan is to knock out four or five episodes a year and you know just keep going basically as long as i can what do you enjoy most about doing it um it's just been amazing being able to connect to so many different people um in the beginning it's hard to find guests um maybe you've had similar struggles <laughs> and um therefore i went to friends first right uh, but once i had a few friends on they were able to introduce other friends and then you know eventually i've had people that i've never spoken to like that was my first time talking to them so it, it's been an incredible experience in regards to just learning about people who've graduated from different eras and um it's been a real privilege to have this platform where i could then you know share that information uh using this platform to other graduates and it's uh, doing quite well, isn't it? I mean, you've got uh, quite a lot of views on uh, a lot of the on the YouTube channel. Um, what's your most uh, popular episode? Um, there was one episode where I interviewed a, a former uh, J-pop uh, singer uh, called Yu Hayami, and um, she actually only attended. Um, so she attended ASIJ in the eighties, uh, not too long. I think about two years. But she's very much still part of the community uh, because her children. Um, now go to ASIJ, although I think they might have recently graduated. And yeah, that that has uh, a good amount of views. It, it definitely has the most views. Well, that's, it might be a little tip for me there, try and get uh, some sort of uh, celebrity on, on board. I mean, I mean, you are quite a celebrity, Nick, but maybe I, I can, uh, maybe you can introduce me. That might just help, help out education talk, maybe. Um. <laughs> yeah, it's the, it's the guests that definitely make a difference. That's one thing I <laughs> realized. Well, I mean, in saying that, um, I think also, like, I, don't, I think I'd be doing this even if only you know, 20 people were, were watching because, you know, it's it's really been a great way to connect um, with people that I, you know, as you say, people I've not met before, but also reconnecting with people that um, perhaps I wouldn't have had this sort of in-depth conversation with. Um, actually, you and I would have a perhaps a discussion similar to this um, you know, when we used to work together, but um, but it is good to be able to really talk with people and reflect. I know it's something which um, people have said they found quite enjoyable, which is also also a great thing. Um, Nick, I want to ask you, what is something that you're currently working on um, that excites you? Yeah, so before I get to that, I just want to say I'm really happy what you said about just 20 people watching, because when I started my podcast, one thing that really stuck with me is um, I was listening to podcasts about podcasts. I don't know if you did that when you started. <laughs> and this one that really stuck with me um, was, and I, I should remember the podcast. I can't, it was like Wizards or something. Anyways, big, big podcast. But they were saying how, uh, you know, a good podcast is one where even if no one is listening, mm. you're still enjoying doing it. And, and that that has always stuck with me. You know, after hearing that, I was kind of like, you know what, that's, that's a great point, you know, at the end of the day, yeah. right? Even if, if this gets lost, <laughs> you never upload it. If it's still a conversation worth having, you know, it, it's it's a podcast worth having. I, although I hope that this video doesn't get lost. Oh. <laughs> it won't go on the cutting room floor. Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, for me too, I, I when I was young, did a community radio show with my friend, school schoolmate of mine. And um, we used to sometimes wonder, is anybody listening to this? Because it would go out onto the, the airwaves across the region and um, in our hometown. And yeah, some couple of times we get, you know, a phone call from uh, workers at the local steelworks telling us, you know, they'd like the show or whatever. So we're like, wow, someone's listening. But I mean, we just did it because we, it was a chance for us to laugh and be a bit silly and um, spend time together. So, you know, and I guess that is essentially what um, these podcasts provide is that your own ability to reflect and your own ability to listen and absorb what people are saying. It's really great. Um, so back to the, um, what are you passionate about? Um, what else, so something you're excited about that you're currently working on, or maybe something you're working towards? Um, it happens every year, uh, but we have a, uh, MUN conference, um, around spring, late winter. And that's always a, a great privilege, uh, to host because, um, you know, we talk a lot as, as educators, like, Hey, get, you know, sort of real life experience or preparation for the real world. Um, but, you know, when I organize this conference with students, you know, it, it's a thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 operation over a weekend. It's essentially like a wedding. It's like being a wedding planner. 
and th it's all real money, right? They're dealing with. So I'm really proud of these kids, you know, who are 17, 18 years old, you know, they, they have to make these decisions. Are we going to spend, you know, 15,000 on food? Are we going to send 11,000 on food? And, you know, how does that change, you know, the optics of the conference? Um, so I, I think it's just phenomenal that they get this real life experience, you know, dealing with money, dealing with organizing with, you know, schools and flights, all these logistical things, which actually now that I say it out loud, maybe don't sound super exciting, but they are incredibly meaningful. Let's go right back to the start. Uh, Jeju, Jeju Island. Uh, what's the best thing about living and working there? Yeah, this this island is so unique. It's less than a million people. Um, for those who are not familiar, the Korean government started this project, right? The Global Education City. Here there are not one or two, but four international schools, and they're all huge, right? A thousand students. Yeah, so I would say, I don't know if it's as much about Jeju Island. Um, I would have to put a little plug in. For a lot of people, it's the nature. Um, it's nice to be able to focus on work, too. There's not too many distractions that maybe you'd get in the big city. Of course, on the opposite end of that, some people want uh, more vibrant city life, right? So you don't get that. So that would be a fair warning to anyone who would want to come work here is that there's not really a vibrant nightlife or, you know, a big city here. Um, with that said, um, if, in regards to the place for education and schools, um, I don't know any other place like this where there's four big schools, which also helps incredibly uh, with extracurriculars, right? You want to play a soccer game? five minute walk. You want to play another soccer game, another school, another five minute walk, mm -hmm. right? There's not many places you can do that. And sort of piggybacking on that idea, you also have the incredible facilities. Right now, yeah. the land is incredibly expensive here. I think apartments run at about $800,000 for a two bedroom. So we're talking like New York City prices. But when everything was built 10 years ago, this place was a farm. So yeah. I want to say NLCS has two soccer fields. We have um, one, we used to have two, but one is uh, out of commission right now. And then, uh, yeah, BHA has a soccer field and an ice skating rink. I don't know many schools, the ice skating rinks. And, you know, St. John's has like three tennis courts and, you know, a soccer field. So um, definitely incredible facilities, uh, which is a, another huge advantage, I think, of being in this uh, education city. Yeah, it's really special, that whole collaboration that happens between those international schools to the benefit of each other. There's things like the professional learning conference uh, that would happen each year, the um, even just the ability to sort of do impromptu network meetings. Uh, I used to join in with um, there'd be a meeting with some of the tech people, um, which was you know, once a month, just a nice way to sort of touch base and sort of share some ideas. There's a lot that goes on between those schools. It's a really great place to be, great community. So Nick, uh, if people want to connect with you, how can they go about doing that? Yes, um, I started a little website some years back um, when I was job hunting and I just, I've continued to keep it up. Um, my contact information is there. It's at uh, nickharrisjapan.com, uh, nickharrisjapan.com. Fantastic, we'll put the link in the description. Um, Nick, it's been fantastic to catch up and uh, have a chat and uh, hoping we can have a chat in person at some point soon. But uh, thanks so much for being on Education Talks. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, having this opportunity to have this conversation. Thank you. Thanks, mate. If you enjoyed this episode of Education Talks, please do share with your friends and colleagues. Don't forget to stay subscribed to catch each new episode.